The climate conversation has never been more divided. As disruptors in this space, we're hungry to find solutions to the challenges our environment faces. Welcome to the Climate Rebels podcast. My name is Joel Caesar. I'm joined by Owen Barrett and Chris Pomerleau. We are experts in clean energy, net zero real estate, decarbonization, and entrepreneurship. We celebrate those who take action against the climate crisis and are striving to make the world a cleaner place. Thanks for joining the conversation. Now, let's get to work. Welcome to the Climate Rebels podcast. Joining me as always is Owen Barrett, self-proclaimed Adam Newman of Green Building. Unfortunately, Chris Pomerleau is not with us today. So Owen and I had a chance to interview our guest, Shanu Matthew. Shanu serves as Senior Vice President and Portfolio Manager at Lazard Asset Management, has nearly a decade of experience in clean energy and investment strategy. Man, Owen, We've had some great guests. I don't know if anyone has dropped as much knowledge about the world of impact slash ESG slash sustainability investment. Um, y- y- people like you and I, we're, we live this world in a way and we talk a lot about it, but you kind of learn, oh, this is a guy who's a pro and dealing with wealthy individuals and crazy amounts of money. So his perspective is just so much more nuanced, researched, and he's really... A, uh, articulate and how he uh, describes these these issues. And I, I know I discovered Shanu through Twitter, and I think he's got this great skill, which is incredibly important in this day and age of taking these wide ranging, complex issues and distilling them into a tweet in a way that, oh, that makes sense, but it also captured nuance. And I understand your position. So I think the guests are going to love hearing more from Shanu. What do you think? Yeah, I think so too. I think it was a great episode. I think, um, you know, in real estate, a lot of time you hear the riches is in the niches, meaning like market choice is super important. Asset choice is super important. And I think the the point that Shanu brings up is the devil's in the details when it comes to, you know, there's going to be a ton of winners in the public markets with um, this clean tech boom, but you can't just invest across the board in a whole industry. You really have to understand sort of the nuances of each one. Um, so I think I think the audience is going to learn a ton. Totally agree. But before we get all to that, we're going to dive into an exciting new segment we're calling If Climate Tech Were an NBA Legend. So this will be the first time we're doing a bit about the uh, intersection of sports and climate tech. I think we're going to have a lot of fun with it. Shanu and I, when we met on Twitter, we discovered we're both big fans of the NBA, and we thought it'd be fun to try to intertwine that love with our love of climate tech and investing. So... Let's dive right in. All right, so here's the ground rules of the bit. I'm going to give credit to Bill Simmons. Uh, I'm a huge fan of his content. He's always had an interesting way of combining sports, especially the NFL and the NBA with pop culture and other interesting facets that people uh, um, that might not be interested in sports might care about, and it's a way to expand our audience. So you and I, both big fans of the NBA here. Mm -hmm. Um, The rules are, we talked about this before the show, we're going to each pick three NBA players and match them to some kind of clean tech. And we're going to describe why that's a match. So I'm going to go first. Are you okay with that? Yeah, let's go. Let's go. All right. So I'm going to say Steve Nash, one of my all-time favorite players, the the conductor of the famous seven seconds or less Phoenix Suns. Uh-huh. And I'm going to say Steve Nash equivalent in climate tech is VPP, virtual power plants. So uh, on this show previously, we had Jigger Shaw with the U.S. Department of Energy describing a lot about virtual power plants and how they're going to be such an important tool in decarbonizing the grid and the global economy. And the virtual power plant, what makes it so special and unique is that instead of adding new, usually fossil fuel driven resources to the grid when the grid is stressed, when it's really hot, everyone's running air conditioning. Instead of doing that, we're going to use software and we're going to use connected devices so that buildings and homeowners can reduce their energy during those times automatically and be paid for that by the utility in this future world. So the reason I say all that was Steve Nash. Steve Nash was a giver and and the Phoenix Suns because mm-hmm. of him at the point guard position and every every team he played for, they were better because not only was he a giver and this great point guard who made everyone around him better, but he had this culture, right? When you play with with Steve Nash, you became someone who you also became unselfish and the team I mean, it's one of my favorite teams of all time, those seven seconds or less Phoenix Suns. They just changed the game at a time when it was getting really stale and getting really slow and getting too isolation driven. And here was this team passing, cutting, moving, shooting. Um, So I'll stop there and let you you go next. 
No, yeah, that's that's like a really great. I, I mean, I, th- those Phoenix Suns nightmare. I was a Kobe Bryant guy growing up, and he's like my favorite player of all time. But uh, I just remember those teams ev- eviscerating the Lakers yeah. sometimes, and it was like Nash was totally ahead of that. And like, like I think like a lot of parallels between like a VPP is going to need to have all these signals and figure out how to optimize them in the best way possible, and that's like totally what Nash did. So I think that was a, that was a good one. Um, I, I'm going to start off hot with my you know, my current favorite player, and it, it, this is my. my uh, my goat in the, in the debate. Well, we won't go down that rabbit hole, but I think um, I, I put LeBron James as, as energy efficiency. Um, and the reason I did this, right, is, is, is I feel like the contributions to the overall climate tech, and I guess like just decarbonization in general, is probably one of the largest, if not the largest. It's cross-sectoral. Uh, it brings the best out of everyone. It makes everyone else's job easier. Uh, it has massive impact when you compare the cumulative totals of, of what it does across sectors, right? I mean, I think people forget about it, but you know, the more efficient we get with things, the less new energy we need to create, the less new systems we need to replace, um, you know, the more we can address other problems. And I think LeBron's done that. And I think the other thing that I really liked was the cross-sectoral application, right? Like you can do this in buildings, you can do it in energy systems, you can do it everywhere else. LeBron, it doesn't matter what team you throw him on, rosters, coach, he's taking you to the finals, he's going to well, back back and he'll do whatever. Is center, is yeah. point guard, can do anything, and, yeah. And that's why I thought that one uh, was, was kind of the, the nice parallel. That's really good. Well, you took mine. I was going to use LeBron for solar. And oh, okay. Similarly, some, some similar points would say this, like, the, it's a constant. So in the world of clean tech, even 30 years ago, solar was was there and continues to be there, just like LeBron, always there. He's in, he's in the finals or the conference finals every year. And then I would also like solar, this idea of knocking it off its perch. You know, everyone's always like, LeBron, is, as obvious as it is, he's the maybe the greatest player of all time. No one wants to acknowledge it. And it's like, solar is the same way. It's like, Solar just keeps coming. Everyone's like, can't we do better than solar? Or solar is not so sexy. And are we sure solar is going to get us there? And the answer is usually like, yeah, solar's still in the mix. And solar's still really important. Just like LeBron. That's a every dang. Year. Oh, wow. Those, those both work. I, this, this is a fun. I was actually was thinking, I was like, I need to write a paper on this. This is a cool idea. Yeah, it is. I know. I was actually struggling whittling it down. And so I'm I'm going to do, uh, I'm, I'll do one next. Because my three were LeBron, Steve Nash, and the one I'm about to get to. But okay. I grew up in the Philadelphia area at a time when Allen Iverson was the king. And he's my favorite player the of all answer. time. Let's go. I was really struggling. I really wanted to get AI in this. And I, I couldn't figure it out. So I just I think maybe need some more time to, to piece it together. Or maybe you can go think about it for me. But so I don't have AI. I'm going to go with Devin Booker here. And my Ooh, parallel okay. is, is nuclear energy. Ah, and I say that in a way because I think it's this like back in vogue message where nuclear, I don't know, what, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. That was when everyone thought nuclear was going to be the thing that that saved us everywhere. It, it was popular back then as this crazy futuristic technology that was going to give us uh, unlimited energy. And then it slowly over time became out of vogue and lots of reasons. Environmentalists challenged the waste and the other challenges that we have with nuclear. But now it's back. And uh, it's as important as anything when people are talking about how do we get to a carbon free future. And the Devin Booker parallel here is the shooting guard position and the mid range game where we talked about Allen Iverson back when, when in the 90s, when, when, when I was younger, the two guard shooting mid range jumpers was the thing that was Jordan, yep. that was AI, that was Rip Hamilton. I mean, there's so many I'm missing. And then when the even the Steve Nash and then the Golden State Warriors t- turned the whole NBA into a three point game that mid range two guard uh, model was, was less in vogue, but uh, Devin Booker has brought it back in, in uh, a really powerful way and awesome, awesome player. And um, I think it'll lead to more people considering, Oh, maybe we got to go back to this dynamic two guard who can score in lots of different ways. And just like we're thinking in the energy industry, Oh, that nuclear thing turns out produces a lot of carbon free energy. Maybe we should really consider uh, scaling that more these days. Love that. No, that's, that, that's awesome. And I think I like that resurgence of the, of the two are, cause that's, that's so true. Or it's like that. It's so funny when you look at players when you're like, if you were in the league 20 years ago or 20 years later, like you would have dominated, but it really just yeah. like, depends on the time. So totally. that's a good one. Um, I'm going to, I have the two other ones, that, but I, I think I'll, I'll go with storage first. Um, and when I think about storage and I'm going to preface the, like it'll lead into when I name the name, but um, if you think about what storage does with the intermittent sources, right? I mean, we typically have the stuck curve and we have too much power in one part of the day and not uh, in other parts of the day. And when we add a bunch of storage to the grid, we'll be able to, you know, shift the the power so we can charge up during the hours where we have a lot of 
intermittent renewable power, and then we can discharge that in periods where demand's high and we don't have as much power generation from those sources. And so when I think about that, I think about tempo changes and kind of controlling that tempo. And, you know, one of the famous, you know, tempo changes, I think, in league history was was the emergence of the Showtime Lakers. So, I mean, it was similar a little bit to how you said the seven, seven second offense. I think this is like the OG run and gun, yeah. you know, get up the court offense. And I, I always think of Magic Johnson just orchestrating that tempo change where it was, you know, they needed to push the pace and to push it all game. Other times you needed to like, you know, slow it down and feed Kareem the ball a little bit more, but was in charge of, you know, that run and gun showtime offense. I just thought of this parallel to storage where, you know, we are changing the the momentum of the game. We're going to change when and where to do things. And, and that just reminded me a lot about magic and his role with it, with the showtime Lakers. That's a great one. And of course, how can you have any lists of NBA legends and not include magic Johnson? Got, gotta have magic on there. All right, I don't have any more. My three, I had LeBron. So you want to you want to finish this off with your last one? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think so this one it, it can apply to. It's more like the shot for, for like so like here like it's, the, the example is going to be this was a weaker one, but it was like it could be Kareem skyhook or Steph's just long ball. And I was going to compare it to hydrogen, and the reason being like there's this massive potential, like really great technology, but in really it needs to be in the right setting and using the right purpose for the right person for it to be truly unlocked, right? Like there's a reason that other people couldn't do the sky hook. There's a reason that people can't ball out like Steph and pull up from 35 feet away and drill them. And it reminded me a lot of hydrogen where it's like in these, you know, unique situations where it's using the right setting. Um, it can be dramatically transformative um, to a lot of like really heavy to abate, hard to stop issues. And I think that's what I think of when I think of like a sky hook or a, or the long ball. Um, and so that was kind of my apparel. That one's a little bit weaker than the other ones. Um, and then I'm gonna give you a bonus one. This one's not a legend yet, but I just thought it was kind of funny where I was thinking about like, what was the parallel for like direct air capture or just like Dak? Oh, and I was yeah, like, all, okay. all the attributes of like really like being helpful and like also if it can scale and just cause like I'm getting a little annoyed with all the Wemben Yana hype. It's like on paper, it's like, oh, this guy can do everything, but does it translate? Will it translate? <laughs> can it scale? And so that was my last one. I almost had a win Vignano one too, so that's great. <laughs> and I don't think the other previous the hydrogen example was weak at all. I think that's genius. And I was going to say, what are, what are the like famous unique shots? I I came to mind the Dirk Nowitzki, the you know, he oh yeah, the one leg, leg up and yeah. shoots the yeah the fadeaway. Well, this has been fascinating. I think Climate Tech. What we've touched LeBron, Steve Nash, Devin Booker. Who did you have here? You had magic. Skyhook, Magic, yeah. and then you're ending with Wembenyama, the future. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, that was really fun, Shano. I, let's let's continue to trade these ideas on Twitter, NBA Legends and Climate Tech. I think it's a good way to bring more NBA fans into the work we do. Let's do it, man. I love it. Thank you for having me on, and this was a really fun bit. Awesome. Well, thank you. Now let's jump into our conversation with Shanu Matthew. Shanu Matthew is currently a research analyst at Lazard Asset Management, a $200 billion global asset manager on the U.S. equity team focused on sustainable investing and net zero research. He began working in the investment field in 2015. Prior to joining Lazard in 2021, Shanu was a vice president and head of ESG at First Eagle Alternative Credit, a $20 billion alternative asset manager. Previous experiences include strategic finance at Expanse, and tech healthcare M&A banking at Evercore. Shanu is a member of the investment committee at Evergreen Climate Innovations, a recurring guest on Wood McKenzie's The Energy Gang podcast, and has spoken frequently at climate-related industry events. So, Shanu, welcome to the Climate Rebels podcast. How are we doing, Joel and Owen? Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for coming on. All right. We know you're a fan of the show, so you know, uh, you know we like to get right to work here. Let's do it. We start every guest with the same question. How are you, a climate rebel? Yeah, I, I came in thinking, you know, what really defines a rebel in, in my eyes? And, you know, the few things that came to mind were someone that is questioning norms, is not afraid to kind of stand out away from the crowd and, and kind of advocate for what they believe is the right path forward. And so when I think about that within climate or sustainability, I think one of the fundamental truths I have is I think we're all solving the same goal. But um, I think a lot of times within sustainability people have are rather dogmatic in their beliefs or, or tribal in, in some ways. And, and, and the reality is, is there's a lot of gray, especially with like the energy transition or something like climate change. And so I think my role as an investor, educator, kind of communicator is, is to help bring nuance to these topics and actually talk about the path forward. Because ultimately, sustainability is something that requires speed and scale. 
and self-sustenance in a lot of ways. So it's, you know, talking through the different angles of, you know, natural gas is probably a bridge fuel that's going to last a lot longer than folks think, you know, solar and wind are, are really great tools in decarbonization, but have their own issues. Um, you know, we're grossly underprepared to update our grid, but um, having those conversations out in public and having those thoughts out in public and just learning um, out there is, is how I think I'm a climate le- rebel is, you know, giving people a platform and to engage with me, at least, you know, I don't know all the answers, but I'm willing to learn and think in public about them. So that's, you know, how I would phrase myself as a climate rebel. Well, I really appreciate that perspective. I, I know, Shano, you and I met through Twitter because I was enjoy your content, enjoy how you are very public about your perspective. Um, I think we've had a, a, a bunch of guests on the show that I've connected with through social media because I'm sitting there enjoying their content and thinking, this is someone I'd love to talk to more. So let's get them on the show. So I think you're totally right that rebelliousness coming from being public is is not easy. There's not a lot of people out there who are willing to show their cards, have a perspective, maybe be wrong, right? This world of climate and energy, it moves so fast, changes so fast. It's so complex, so dynamic, so easy for people to sit back and say, I don't want to be the one out in the public forum of Twitter having stances, but thank you for doing what you do. The point about being in the gray is so important. We hear it you know, on social media all the time where sustainability folks want to stop drilling instantly. Like, let's get off oil. Let's get off gas right now. And and then um, on the other side, people will say, "We, can, you know, there's not the transmission lines to handle from solar and wind to, for this full electrified net zero um, economy that we're going for." And it, it's like people miss this transitionary period that we're in. Like that's the important part that we're stepping in the right direction. And it's just so refreshing to hear someone that lives in the gray area because that's where we spend most of our time, um, and it's where we're going to be for the next, you know, twenty years until the or maybe longer, but until this, this, uh, transition is completed. Yeah. I mean, I, I echo both of what you said, and I think it's so important just because I think a lot of people are scared to have those opinions because you're forced to go to the loudest voices, which are often the most extremes. And then you kind of drown out the actual substantive convo. And then I think Joel, to your point being wrong, I mean, like you've seen it, if you follow me, like I, I have no problem, like making a hypothesis and then being proven wrong. I think that's like the, the beauty in it is like having that humility to realize that there's new info and new assumptions to update. And that's hopefully what I try to do when I deliver kind of messages or, or dive into topics. Yeah, I think we can all appreciate humility. I think it's it's needed in this space. Let's let's set some ground rules first here. We know, uh, Shano, you're probably the first guest we've had who's um, currently actively at a financial institution. So we know there's probably some things you're not supposed to say, allowed to say. <laughs> so I, I, I got to tell my co-host here who seemingly forgets <laughs> this message every week, which I tell him, we are not here to be a political podcast. So Owen... I'm going to reinforce it here because we have to make sure um, we abide by that this week with our very special guest. Shani, do you listen to the All In podcast? I do. I love it. I feel it. like are, are, are I feel like well, there's yeah, yeah, exactly. Like it's <laughs> you know, I'm constantly told I can't talk about things, so I'm constantly towing the line about what can we actually talk about. <laughs> Yeah, it, well, then true it all in fashion, then I'll, I'll be Friedberg and have to <laughs> remove myself from the situation if that happens. No, I got yeah, it. We'll, just, we'll, we'll make it work. Yeah, exactly. Just leave the room if it gets uncomfortable. <laughs> all right. We got that out of the way. We'll try to steer clear of, of politics here. But uh, yeah, Shanu, I, I think that's a good segue. I, I teed up a little bit. I know you've got a decorated career. We, we, talk, we, we gave you your introduction here at the top of the show, all these great places you worked, you know, at the front lines of ESG and impact investing and all these buzzwords that... Um, a lot of us who are of the belief that the private sector is going to really accelerate the transition to a net zero future, um, believe the roles you've, you've had, the companies you've worked with that have made these roles possible are really important to this future. So tell us what you're doing now and, um, feel free to expand a little bit on, uh, on the other positions you've had in the past. Yeah, absolutely. So hello to the audience. You know, Joel got into my background, but name is Shanu Matthew. I'm currently a senior vice president and portfolio manager at Lazard Asset Management. And so, you know, a lot of fancy buzzwords, but ultimately what that boils down into is investing in companies that are listed public equities. And we're trying to capitalize on the fundamental shift towards sustainability as a society. And so, you know, the funds that I work with, um, or at least I'm a portfolio manager on is the explicit hypothesis is that companies that are positioned to or contributing to a more sustainable society measured as greener, fairer, healthier, safer, will actually stand to benefit and outperform companies that are not as well positioned. And so, you know, basically it's marrying that secular tailwind of sustainability to fundamental attributes 
traditional things you think about faster top line, higher addressable market, better profitability, better free cash, cash flow generation, or higher rates of return on invested capital. Um, and we're trying to invest in those companies and outperform the market. And so, you know, a lot of what my job entails is covering clean technology companies and sectors and trying to find out, you know, where is the actual value being created and can we invest in those companies early on in their, you know, inflection points or, or growth trajectories so we can compound our capital uh, as a long term partner there. When I first got to Lazard, my job was a lot more about understanding how to systematically look at things like climate change in the investment process. So as I'm sure listeners are aware of, you know, topics like net zero, carbon neutral companies were the last few years have been kind of, you know, there's rapid fire PR of all these things. And, um, you know, what we really wanted to do is at a holistic bottom up level for all the companies we invest in is look at, you know, what do topics like net zero mean? What is the climate change? mean for some of these companies, you know, in some cases, it's like an actual material process or material substitution. In some cases, it's business model change. In other cases, it's not that material. And that's okay to say. Um, and so I think that was a lot of what we did. And then that eventually led into covering companies and now, you know, ultimately making decisions that lead to how we manage the portfolio. And so happy to take any questions there. But I guess beyond that, like the background you, you got into, so I won't belabor. The one thing I would say, and I would just encourage if people are listening in the audience, uh, for the longest time ever, I was doing finance as my day job and, and full-time gig and climate change was something I was just personally passionate about. And like those two things make a lot of sense now and they intersect a lot too, but trust me five years ago when I was trying to network with folks, you know, people were always like, like, we don't really need your skill set. Like, what, what are you doing, man? Like, it's cool that you're interested in this, but uh, it doesn't really matter. But I think uh, you never know when your two worlds will converge. So climate was something I would kind of like self-taught, self-networked. Uh, and then over time you build up enough expertise, or at least you hear enough smart people talk and pick up a little bit what they're saying. And, then you position yourself at the intersection of two really big mega trends. And so that's how I got to where I'm at now. That's so interesting, Shanu. Joel and I met at grad school 10 years ago, I think 11 years ago, and I had a very similar experience. I was trained in, in the finance world, went to school for finance, spent um, you know my first couple of years of my professional career in the finance industry, wanted to make this leap to sustainability, but there really wasn't a way to do that. And so I had to go to grad school to get a piece of paper that said, I know about sustainability. That's where I met Joel. Mm -hmm. And then similar to you kind of found myself sitting in between these two worlds that now are like colliding at a massive level. So it's cool to hear you have kind of a similar background. Definitely. Shanu, just for the record, he wouldn't have that piece of paper if he wasn't copying off me and all the <laughs> groups. So I'll be sat well, next I, to Joel. You know, it's, I, I, <laughs> I want to learn a lot. I want to learn a lot from you here, Shauna, today, and I want our guests to as well. Um, so, and I that even that point you just made about we hope there's people watching the show, especially young people who are like trying to learn. Um, we, one of our goals here was to be approachable, be provocative, make this a little more fun, and about disruptors and not about wonky ESG terms that probably you're used to using every day and in, in your day job. But that message of you can start anywhere to people out here listening. It's it's come up a few times with previous guests. We had a woman named Lisa Conway, and she's vice president of sustainability at Interface, this you know international leading manufacturer of, of carpet down in down in Georgia. But she told a story about how she started in sales and she knew she was at this impact focused company. Her CEO had written a book about sustainability and how important it was. She started getting involved in the side, started some uh, nonprofit in her uh, hometown of Philadelphia, found her way into sustainability. Now she's one of the most influential sustainability officers in the country. So there's a message you just affirmed. Owen said he's got a similar story. Lots of people do. I, I could tell various weird roles I had previous to getting into true sustainability work that were related and helped me build my portfolio and my, um, my resume. But yeah, anyone out there, like we continue to say. Every job is a climate job in the future. I'm sure you'd agree. A hundred percent. And like, that's a beauty and the curse of the space being so new and, and so rapidly evolving is that, you know, there's no defined pathway for someone to be like, oh, hey, you need to do X, Y, Z program or do X, Y, Z job. But then that's also there in your opportunity is if you're the one that, you know, roll up your sleeves and do the hard work. You know, I think people reward that and say, hey, this, pro this person can solve problems for me. This person's, you know, helping me do good work in the space. And, you know, therein lies your opportunity. Well, I'd love to maybe dive deeper here into Lazard for a quick second. Um, one of the, <laughs> Owen's actually pretty outspoken on this show uh, about calling institutional impact investors full of shit. It's actually in the trailer of our, our show. And we don't need to answer that question right now, but I guess I, I think for us, it's, it's cool to have someone on who can show us or tell us what's it like behind the curtains. Now I know we can't get into too much specifics about your work, but I'd love to know, in the conversations that are happening with people who 
may or may not care about climate. Let's let's just assume that's the case. And we're not criticizing anyone out there, what their stance is and how they're trying to generate wealth with their own hard earned money. But, you know, is it, do you, do you hear a lot of, Hey, I want to be part of the solution. I want my money to do good things. Or is it, this is a trend that's happening and I want to work with a company like Lazard who sees it and sees the whole picture and knows that, you know, we can talk about doing good or not, but there's a message about this is just the right investment. I think, you know, we'll, we don't want to get into the, the lightning rod of ESG, but maybe you can tell us a little bit. What's it like? What's it like behind the curtains? How are these conversations with investors going? Shanu, can I clarify something that Joel likes to bring up all the time? So I, I stand by the fact that yeah. most institutional impact investors all are full of shit, but I would not classify Lazard as an impact investor I, on the podcast that I was telling you, I listened to um, where you were the guest, you really eloquently broke down the difference between ESG investing, impact investing, and I think sustainability investing. I can't remember the, the third bucket, but I think yep, Lazard is more correct. the third bucket. You guys aren't touting yourselves as an impact investor, are you? No. So I, well, as it, at an institutional level, you know, Lazard is, is a traditional financial institution and, and it doesn't take, I mean, there's strat, there's a ton of strategies, right? So I mean, there's equity strategies, fixed income within equity, there's different regions or different strategies and varying degrees of ESG integrated as one topic. There's non-ESG, non-ESG integrated, there's sustainability focus, which is like a portfolio that I work on. And then there's impact focus, which we don't have many strategies that are geared towards that today, but other institutions do. And those things, I think what we get caught up in, or there's like a misinterpretation by a lot of folks is that Financial institutions can be a house for all these different types of strategies with varying degrees of views on sustainability. And that's just the nature of the business. It doesn't necessarily reflect that like two portfolios can be drastically different in how they approach and value securities and their investment process and their emphasis on sustainability. And so an, an institution that's diversified like Lazard, um, you know, is very much focused on, on alpha generation. It's ultimately, you know, what are the mechanisms we have in place to better do our job, which is, you know, value securities and generate good returns for our investors. So I think to pivot back to like Joel's question, you know, in a question like, do you have folks that are like, I want my dollars aligned with high impact, high sustainability, um, or do you want folks that are just specifically alpha generated? I think you see a bit of both, right? It ultimately depends on the region and the preferences of the client. Um, I think what is interesting for us in, in the way that we approach this problem is that we think our edge and, and our hypothesis lies in inherently within sustainability. So it's ultimately like we're trying to capture, or if you think about the investor's job, you take a step back, is to capture inflection points that are underappreciated or misunderstood by the market. And so in a situation like sustainability, right, you're dramatically changing how a lot of industries operate. Um, and that leads to a lot of you know, you know new opportunities and products and services to sell into higher margin or lower margin services, um, a lot of capital deployment that may or may not be at attractive rates of return. And for people like us that are in the weeds on this stuff, we can actually really help identify attractive investment opportunities as a result of that. And so like, let me give you a few examples because I think it helps bring it to life. Um, if you think about something like electric vehicles, right, and like the chips that go into vehicles, traditionally in an internal combustion engine, you know, you might have, so call it for $800 of addressable content per vehicle if you're a traditional chip maker. In an electrified, you know, software defined vehicle, the future, which is a lot where we're going to, addressable content per vehicle can go to $2,400. And a lot of times it's on higher margin chips. So if you're a supplier to that industry, right, we're talking about higher addressable market size, higher content per vehicle, higher profitability per vehicle. Let me remove all the buzzwords about sustainability, decarbonization, electric vehicles, et cetera, right? That's just a good thesis, right? That's fundamental attributes that are growing about the business. And I think a lot of times when you talk to clients, whether their preference on sustainability is there or not, that's just an attractive approach to investing. That's an attractive idea for alpha generation. And that's what we try to posit too, is, is ultimately like, are the, is the work that we're doing ultimately getting to a better investment conclusion? That's different from impact investing, right? Impact investing is you're investing with a specific attention or focus on a KPI or a metric that, def that you define as impact. And then you're ad advocating on behalf of your capital to get that outcome. And so that's like drastically different than like sustainability oriented investing, which is, you know, explicit idea that alpha can come from focusing on the sustainability. And then there's also like ESG integrated, which I think, you know, this also gets conflated with the other two. ESG is just focused. It's an investment toolkit slash framework. And it's pretty much only the appreciation that there's certain non-financial factors, whether qualitative or quantitative, that can impact an investment thesis. And that can go both ways, right? Like over-appreciated ESG risk. So you think that it's overblown and people are like, to your point about fossil fuels earlier, like you might invest in an energy company because you think that like people are undervaluing the assets and that they're going, they're going, um, they're actually going to be around a lot longer than you think. And there's like under-appreciated ESG risk. So, you know, a company that, actually has a product that's going to be substituted out a lot faster than the market thinks due to consumer behavior or regulatory changes. And so ESG can actually go both ways, but it's just, it's not an ideology. It's an investment framework. And again, like 
I think we view ESG and sustainability as through the lens of how can we get better at investing and how can we generate more alpha? And that's the kind of the delineation. I think a lot of times people that get angry about the buckets are conflating the three very different things. I just learned a lot. So thank you. Thank you for bringing that to, to this show. I, you know, the it, it, interesting you talk about this intersection of, or the inflection point, and that's the investor's job. Um, this show is, is sponsored by our company, Raven. Um, we're a, a net zero energy focused real estate company. We buy buildings and convert them to net zero. And um, I remember years ago, I, I was speaking at a conference on this building I worked on in Santa Monica, and it's, it was net zero. It's one of the world's greenest buildings. And this guy came up to me after the, after the session and said, you know, I'm a third generation oil money, Israeli. Uh, I'm taking over the family fund. I want to invest in sustainability. It's really important to me. He's like, I came to this conference because I have a thesis. This was probably 2017. He said, I think the right thing to do is about to become the smart thing to do financially when it comes to net zero and buildings. And maybe we've already reached that point. And that was 2017. And I, I took the guy's information. I was like, eh, I don't know about for there yet, but I'm going to, I'm going to remember you. And then when Owen and I got together, what, five years ago to launch the company Z&E Capital, which is what was before Raven, he was one of the first guys I called. I was like, we have a business model because I think your thesis was right. We've reached this inflection point. This is, isn't just thing, the right thing to do. This is smarter business. And I'm sure you can agree in everything you see. Um, that's where the massive change and impact is going to be when these businesses can stand on their own merits. Definitely. And that's honestly where you'll make the most money and, and, and impact, right? Is like at that inflection point. Because if you go before there's an inflection point and, and it's either subsidized by something else or it's not economical, like the that falls apart pretty quickly at scale, right? Especially in the scale of publicly listed companies, like you end up going bankrupt or, or you'll be bought out or whatever. But if you catch that inflection point, right, you'll be handsomely rewarded as an investor and or a partner. And so I think like identifying that point and realizing that it's not going to, it's not like all decarbonize, decarbonizing technologies become economical at once, right? Like there'll be different phases of maturity cycles. There'll be different innovations that occur that do that. And I think that's what makes it exciting from my lens is that someone who's willing to do the work can actually see a lot of the upside and, and generate a lot of impact. Um, but you got, need to be able to understand these like nuances, the different technology pathways and the potential of them. Well, we'll get to your social media handles at the end of the show so we can encourage guests to follow you. But I, I'll just, I'd love for you if you can here, Maybe describe your process. This this will be less impact investing, less ESG, less finance, less climate rebels. This is more social media, marketing, branding, I think we're going to ask you about here. Um, because, again, I found you because I'm like, look at this guy. He's just dropping knowledge bombs all the time on Twitter. I learned so much from you before we ever met. And I guess you talked about it a little bit earlier about why you're a climate rebel and these public opinions you're willing to um, propose on on Twitter. But Tell us a little about your process. I mean, you're studying this stuff all day, I guess, right? It's part of your job to be an expert, to understand trends, to evaluate new market data that comes available. But then you're turning it into these really succinct, perfectly delivered tweets. I mean, it's an incredible skill. So how much work goes into it? Is, is the tweet a reflection of your day job and it's so easy to you because you made certain conclusions and you want to share them? Or are you systematically thinking about the content for social media at points during your day job? It's a great question. I, I'm trying to formulate an answer. I think that could be coherent to the audience here, but I, I think a lot of it, I mean, has just kind of come along the way in terms of, so like right now, like, yes, there's very much a lot of overlap between the day job and, and the content that I'll share. I, I share on the social media channels and it's largely a function of um, now that I'm in a position to really understand these macro trends and how it actually impacts companies and companies that are, the, you know, the largest within these sectors, what they're doing. Um, those things, are rarely aligned with what I'm sharing content about in terms of decarbonization and the energy transition and all that. But before that, it pretty much was because like my jobs weren't necessarily aligned one to one with that. Um, it had to be reading outside done at work. So I mean, a lot of what I do is is just collate information from sources that I think are, are really interesting. So I mean, like when, even outside my like right now, like day job, like that gives you access to different sell side resources. So this is like these are like banking teams that pretty much focus exclusively on sustainability and energy transition. So I get to read their research and, and you know share little tidbits that I think are really fascinating. But before that, it's a lot of newsletters, a lot of literature. Um, Twitter itself is really great for finding academics that you know. I mean, how often do you get to see a researcher group? spent years just working on something and then explain their entire body of work or their thesis in like 20 tweets. Um, you know, it's just like active learning. 
Uh, and so, I mean, over, over the top podcast is another great topic, right? You get to hear from experts and it's almost like you're at a kitchen table with them, just digesting as much information as possible. So, I mean, if you compound that over several years, you start to pick up pattern recognition on, you know, the signals that you think are actually really fascinating or, you know, when a topic's really interesting to dive into. And so over the years built up more and more of my personal opinions, I like to put those down to keep me intellectually honest in terms of like, what did I believe when, and then can I actually, you know, refine those viewpoints over time. And, and I think. Um, that's kind of how I, I've, I've got it to it, but basically it's, yeah, it's a lot of consuming, uh, you know, a lot of other smart people's opinions and then, you know, collating them down to the data points that I think are most relevant and interesting to, to folks that are trying to learn or seeking to learn like I am. Shanu, have you ever been in a position where your, your personal opinions, your, and your tweets have gotten you in hot water with, um, sort of your professional life? And the reason that I asked that is obviously we're vocal about things that we believe in here on the climate rebels podcast. And you know, from time to time, we talk shit about carbon offsets. Um, and we were trying to partner with a, with a company that was helping us raise equity for some of our deals, but also had another business that was kind of focused on carbon offsets. And they, um, they didn't demand, but they maybe politely advised that we didn't talk so much shit about offsets because it would be harder to partner in the future. So I'm curious if you've ever run into that, because when you put strong opinions out there, just naturally, not everybody's going to agree with you. Yeah, no, it's it's a great point. And I mean, I'll, honestly, I think the way that I approach this is that, and I think this is one of the reasons that Joel and I first talked or chatted was that I, I like to stay really evidence-based or fact-based and, and kind of laying out any opinions that I have. And, and it's more so I'm not necessarily saying I believe this because it's an emotional appeal. It's more, I have this opinion based on this research that I'm seeing or this evidence. And this is how I got to that conclusion. Like, tell me where I'm wrong. And yeah, I think yeah. that like, that's really powerful, especially in a job like mine, right? So, I mean, I'm paid to be independently thought and, and validate your own claims, right? Like I'm not supposed to just take someone else's claim or research and just say like, this is hundred percent right. I mean, I'm supposed to question it. I'm supposed to independently validate it. It's supposed to see if I can do the back of the envelope math and figure out if that's actually s sensical or not. Um, and that's okay to be wrong, right? Like that'll happen occasionally, but I mean, ultimately it's in the pursuit of like the greater truth. And so I, I always say one of the benefits of my job is like marrying intellectual curiosity with intellectual honesty. So I mean, something like offsets, right? I mean, like, I think I probably wouldn't say like, I guess I probably wouldn't have or have take a, so in terms of like the entire market is like bogus or something like that. Right. But like, if you look at like general, like trends in the offset market, right? Like there's far more issuances. There are retirements. A lot of the dollars per ton that these things move at are like low dollars per ton. Um, and then typically avoidance based credits. Like this is just stuff that like the index or like the markets will give you. And so like one can deductively reason that, all right, that a lot of this stuff that is trading is like not meaningful or not super impactful to decarbonization. And I don't think that's necessarily like an emotional take or an anger, angry one, right? It's just like a fact-based like show me where the flaw is in the logic. But that being said, you also can say that there's a lot of marketplaces doing really good work, right? So like I'd argue like people that are working with removal platforms that are selling carbon removals that are permanent at like $600 plus a ton. And the people that are buying them don't need to do spend that much in order to procure that removal. Like that's really good work within like, you know, the, that's like, that's more removals and offsets. But again, just kind of laying out that logic for folks and then letting them make their own conclusions, I think is like the way to approach it, or at least what I've tried to do. And that's been working for me yeah yeah totally agree i hope you're taking notes owen see see how he just <laughs> delivered that he, he, he can be he can have an opinion but you don't have to be talking shit and preventing us from having business partners in the future <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, no it, at the end of the day it all worked out you know just got to tone down tone down the edge a little bit it's it's good though, right? I mean, I think I think that the world's short of uh, opinions because, and again, this is kind of one of the reasons that I feel like you have to have the confidence to, to say stuff a lot. Because even if, all right, oh, and if you get, go out there, you have an opinion, and your partner walks through why, like that's a wrong opinion. Like it seems like you have the humility to be like, all right, I've changed my opinion X Y Z because of these new facts. And I think that's what's yeah, more yeah. important than just being silent and adopting a hundred percent. Yeah, there's nothing worse than strong opinions and the inability to to change your opinions when you see fact that proves yourself wrong. Agree a hundred percent with that. Totally. I would Thankfully, give I'm never wrong. I was going to say, I wouldn't give credit. <laughs> Don't give Owen credit for having humility. That's something we think we need to work on here. <laughs> All right, Shana, let's move on a little bit. Uh, let's let's talk about how you got into this. You you described climate on the side and it wasn't your day job and eventually it became, and now you're this thought leader um, that we all uh, respect and admire. But um, tell us that story. How did you get passionate about climate in this industry? Like what, what, what led you to sort to to pursue a, a different sector of your primary career yeah uh, you know i ri first originally got interested in climate change back when i was in undergrad so i'm, I'm dating myself here a little bit but it's probably like in 2011 2012 timeline um and, and, and you know the 
the reason I got into it was actually kind of funny looking back now is, I mean, I, I like many other people read apocalyptic headlines, the world's ending and there's gonna be dragons and all this stuff. And, and I was like, wow, like, like either this is going to be real and I should probably know a little bit about it or two, there's probably more to the story here. Um, but it does seem like a big, you know, hairy problem that society will need to solve. And, and thankfully ended up being the latter. Um, and so as more, the more I investigated it, you know, one of the things that really made it uh, close to home for me is my parents are first generation immigrants from India and they're from a really rural part of India. And I mean, if you think about, you know, extrapolate where we're going with a warming climate, like a lot of the impacts will be felt by nations like India where they didn't really contribute to the problem are going to be like the worst recipients of, you know, the negative impacts or externalities from it. And so for someone like me, I mean, I like feel like I've been really been at like, um, fortunate in the f sense of being able to be raised here and in a rich developed society. And uh, just seeing the generational differences between like what my parents had to grow up in and I had to grow up made me really passionate about a problem that I can, you know, in theory, give back a lot to is if I help contribute to, you know, doing my part and helping us decarbonize as a global economy, then, you know, I can somewhat, I guess, repay that favor in a lot of ways and in, in, in the benefit of where I was growing up. So I got really interested in the problem. And, you know, from there, you just sort of pick it apart in terms of like, all right, like what are the sources of emissions? How do we actually reasonably remove those emissions? Like where do we have viable economic alternatives and can switch and like you need policy help or where are the other areas where we need dramatic technology innovations or step changes in, in, you know, our, our, our ability to influence like the chemistries of certain industries. And so, um, you know, you start picking apart that long enough, you start to pick up different verticals that you're more fascinated by given the finance background, right? A lot of my jobs were typically investing related or companies related. And over time you realize that like co corporations or companies are going to be a really big part of the climate problem problem, right? Whether it's early stage and your entrepreneurs that are creating these new technologies or fostering these new business models to market, um, or you're a big corporation changing how you do things from a procurement standpoint, from the products and services you offer, all those things have dramatic implications for the climate. And, you know, being able to connect those two is ultimately what I'm able to do in this role now, where it's really interesting, where it's, you get to attack the problem of climate change through like a corporate lens of like, you know, how do I bring things to scale in an efficient way um, that can sustain itself in a capitalistic society, but also dramatically improve, you know, the overall sustainability of, of our world or economy or sector. And so that's where it's really fascinating for me and where I've been able to tie it to. Very fascinating. Oh, and I got, we probably have time for two more questions. We got the, the one question we always end with. So you want to take it? Yeah. So Joel mentioned to me that you guys met via a, a Twitter romance, um, which is cute. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so I was looking at some of your tweets and I, and one st stood out to me and it's because of, <clears throat> I've spent so much time in, in sort of the, I guess, private markets. Um, you know, the complaint that I hear about the public markets is that they're so focused on short-term results, one month, one quarter, whatever it may be. And one of your tweets called out that, um, I think climate tech funds or maybe just climate funds generally underperform uh like the the, the dow jones s&p 500 etc in the first two years but then outperform those like years three and five and so i'm just kind of curious is there internal <clears throat> momentum against some of these sustainability investments knowing that the short-term returns may be lower although the long-term returns may be higher does that make sense no yeah it makes sense as a question I I'll just step back just to break out the tweet in isolation that you're referring to is one that just tracked clean energy, popular ETFs or indices against the popular Dow Jones, NASDAQ and S&P. And what it showed, at least relative to today, was over a three and five year basis, they dramatic or they were competitive slash outperformed depending on the ETF or fund. And on a one year and two year basis, they underperformed materially. Um, that's a lot more result of macro. Honestly, it was that rates have been really going up. There's a weakened macro economic environment. And so a lot of these rapid growth, fast growing companies um, have struggled to perform or have come back quite a bit. So I think it's less so idiosyncratic to the clean energy transition. But I think you bring up a really good point where, you know, there is this kind of friction between the, the need to hit next quarter's numbers and next year's numbers and climate change being, you know, a multi-year problem and a lot of these products and services needing multiple years to scale. And I think it ultimately comes down to the, the capital pool that you have and, and the allocator. And so what that means is like, you know, if you're a hedge fund, you might not care about these issues because again, you only care about next quarter's earnings. But for the most folks that are in the space, or for example, for us, you know, we're in the business of long-term compounding of capital, meaning that, you know, we're looking for co companies that can sustain themselves over multiple years of, of time. So when we underwrite a company, you know, we're planning to hold that for three, five plus years. And so 
I think a lot that gives a lot of time for these products and services to to come to maturity and as well as these sustainability factors to play out. That being said, right, I think this goes back to the inflection points is like a lot of the investments we've made, I mean, we've seen near-term catalysts is what they're called that will actually move the stock price, um, even in like relatively nascent markets. So, um, you know, for example, like we own like a lithium producer and there was this huge debate amongst Wall Street or whether like lithium prices were going to crash back to like the normal $10,000 per metric ton than they were pre the crazy run up during like the 2020 to 2022 period when they went from 10,000 to $80,000 a metric ton. And, um, you know, like that's lithium is a metal that goes into batteries that go into EVs or stationary storage. It's one of the only ones that is popular across a lot of different chem battery chemistries. And so it's a metal that's going to be needed for the transition for the next 30 plus years. Um, but there's like this near term catalyst where there was discrepancies on where the street thought the price was going. If you did a little bit of work, you can kind of see that there was a marginal cost producer that was at a level that was relatively high and then more than the market was appreciating at the time. So for example, people like us were able to invest in a company that we realized that they were going to get this like high realized price that the market was not, were overestimating the potential downside to. And so that stock really worked out. So that's, a, that's something like, like a theme that's investable for the next 30 plus years, but had this catalyst that actually returned handsomely for like, you know, like a one year period, for example. So I think it's all just about like the relative positioning within each sector. And then I do agree with you that on a longer term basis, a lot of these themes need years to play out, but it doesn't mean that you can't generate good returns and make good investments on a shorter time horizon. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Man, that's, that's a great answer. I'm learning a ton here today. Let me, let's try to learn a little bit more before we get to the last question. <laughs> I know you can't uh, opine here on individual stocks, but can you tell us clean tech in general, how's it performing high level? Is there any insights you can give based on your uh, expertise here to us and our guests? Yeah. I, I mean, so I, I don't want to belabor the, the response from last question, but I think on a multi-year basis, like, you know, there have been some really big winners, uh, right? So I'd point to like, there's some solar equipment winners. There's um, obviously a really big electric car company that I won't get too much into valuation. I'm sure you can guess who I'm talking about, but that's obviously been a massive winner. I think like right now you're still in the, the nascency period of clean tech. Um, you know, there was a huge SPAC boom in the last few years. A lot of those companies actually aren't positioned too well, to be honest, and have traded really poorly. Um, but then you, you do have some of these like secular winners. And depending on what you're willing to include in clean tech, if you include like the picks and shovel suppliers to, to these industries, like some of them have done really well. So I mean, like long story short is like the answer's um, mixed for sure. But I think like what the interesting opportunity is, is that a lot of these industries are just starting to hit scale. They're just starting to hit commercial adoption. And so like a lot of the opportunity lies in you know, you know, the go forward. So for example, like one of the things that people kind of look at me confused when I, when I tell them is like, if you look at like the IRA passing, right. I think everyone understands it's a catalyst towards clean energy deployment, um, should be a boon to most of these industries. I looked at a basket of like 50 exposed pure play stocks and on like, the average and the median were both down 20% since the IRA was passed. And, and that's largely a function of like, again, that kind of macro where you're in a rising rate environment, that's actually really tough for businesses to rely on financing um, or, you know, like needing rapid growth. And so I think it's interesting because there's a lot of opportunity out there, especially in areas or technologies where you are hitting an inflection point, but you need to, you need to have the, the nuances and understandings of the different markets to understand when to invest and if you're going to catch the right side of it. Like, so for example, commonly popular held debates right now are like residential solar in the United States. Like there's a huge argument that like, we're about to hit a really big slowdown. And so people are like selling some of those stocks, like that could be attractive you know, entry points for other investors that might be more longer term oriented. Um, there's debates in EVs in terms of like whether OEMs can actually hit their long term targets. Um, and so that, that might inform how you position yourself in the near term. So um, long story, I, I probably got a little long winded there. But ultimately, it's, it's that, you know, performance has been mixed. I think there's a few really big winners that have really helped out some of these ETFs that are like cap weighted towards those winners. Um, but over the time, I think the hypothesis is over the next three, five, 10 years, you'll see a lot more companies and a lot more hit maturity. And so you can see, you know, room for outperformance. But I think like the one thing that we'd stress, and I probably have a little bit of tunnel vision is like, you didn't need to be really selective about these things. Like, it's not like you can make a basket bet on solar or a basket bet on EVs and all those stocks will do well. And I, I, this is something I harp on annoyingly on Twitter, but just because there's macro momentum doesn't mean that there's like idiosyncratic, every single company wins. Like these are really tough, challenging businesses. Like, you know, they're deflationary equipment, they're commodities are sometimes you're selling. Um, so these are like challenging business models. So you need to really look at these with a fine, you know, tooth lens to actually pick out who the winners will be. Just real quick, before we get to the last question, the residential solar, comment that's I was, because I, I was gonna ask the same question that's yeah, because like, get, financing costs are yeah, going why, up why does the market think there's a slowdown in residential solar 
Yeah, I mean, so it, it, it depends on like, like which part of the value chain you're playing in. But so like the argument would be that, yeah, rates are rising. So the payback periods for solar systems are, are getting higher and people are getting a little less uh, or less comfortable with signing up to, to purchase something that might have a, a little longer payback period. The other major change that happened in the U.S. was uh, the passage of NEM 3.0. So without getting too in the weeds here, right, like there used to be a crediting mechanism. If you got solar that you'd get paid by, uh, you know, the California ISO uh, to do. Uh, and then now that they changed the mechanism such that it makes solar plus storage cheaper on the whole, but you don't get compensated nearly as much for having solar on board. So it's like installations have grown or, or have slowed down quite a bit. Like we don't have a ton of data points just yet because the solar companies haven't reported Q2 just yet when, it was, when that change happened. But a lot of the incremental data points so far suggest a slowdown. And then if you look at kind of equipment or what they call channel checks, um, a lot of folks are running high on like storage and they're also running high on like certain inverters. And so what, what that means, right? Like in a natural supply demand type environment, you have too much supply, you have weakening demand, that means prices come down. And so that's the debate there in terms of some of the, that doesn't mean that like residential solar won't grow, um, but this is like relative to the companies where right? you were, in, when you invest in a company, you're investing on the perception of the future cash flow. So sometimes a lot of these companies, especially in like clean tech or solar or whatever else, get a lot of forward credit for the growth, right? Because everyone underwrote this fantastic story. And so when you see some cracks in it, you can see companies, what we say, derate pretty hard in terms of like, you know, what people are willing to pay based on like the, the latest economic conditions. So that's kind of what the story is going on in solar. And so I think this 2Q will actually be really, really interesting because companies will, one, report numbers that are backward looking, but they'll also have a lot more insight into how third quarter's gearing up to be and what their outlook is for the rest of the year. And I think that you'll see a lot of, you know, this stuff kind of move or you'll get more insight into what folks are thinking about this industry. Great insight. Uh, like the all in podcast, we like to pause sometimes to make sure the, our audience understands an acronym. So I'm going to put Owen on the spot. Oh, and he said NEM3, net, uh, net metering. <laughs> you want to define what net metering is for the audience? I was actually going to ask another question, but I thought you'd yell at me. Um, I was surprised that, so net metering is the ability to to sell energy back to the grid it's not available in all utility jurisdictions so solar the, the economics of solar works best in utilities with net metering nem3 is only specific to california so the question that came to me when you said that is is a california market such a big piece of the overall us residential solar that nem3 is could potentially have negative effects on the entire country is that sort of what you're alluding to with NEM3? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, California is the biggest market by far, right? I mean, like there's other pockets that have gotten pretty big as well, like, like, like the Northeast and, and parts of the South. Uh, but I mean, California, yeah, undoubtedly has been the biggest residential contributor. So like, like a material slowdown in that market affects the overall aggregate numbers for the country, right? I think what you'll see, depending on the commentary you hear from different companies is like, you, some will see pockets of strength in some other regions, but like, is it enough to offset the weakness in California yeah. would be like the, the, I think that's the data point people are willing to, to see, right? So if California comes in stronger than anticipated, right, you might be more optimistic on annual numbers for residential. If it comes in weaker, you might start to like lower your numbers a little bit. And I think that's what people are, that those are the exercises that are going on behind closed doors. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I know you're ner you're not allowed to pick individual stocks, but Joel, we should put some money in uh, domestic PV module manufacturers because I wonder if the increase in the tax credit from the IRA will offset the higher uh, financing costs. Well, this, so, is this, like, is, this is like Shano. This is you putting your uh, position out there publicly and <laughs> seeing how it plays out. Well, it was yeah. I mean, this one, right? Like you can actually observe. I, again, I, I won't mention names, but like, um, when you think about com like, well, we're always looking for a sustainable competitive advantage, right? And so like, there's different ways to unpack that. It's like, you know, brand or intangible assets, network effects, technology advantages, scale. Uh, you just brought up a really good one, right? We're a clean tech um, industry, especially one that's getting increasingly involved in geopolitics and standing up our own supply chain. There's not a ton of domestic manufacturing for solar modules today, right? So there's been a one clear, obvious winner since the, since the IRA passed um, that you can easily look up. Uh, that makes is it one of the scale players in domestic manufacturing of solar modules, right? So that's seen like actual, uh, you know, it's performed well since the IRA has passed because of that very nature where it's like, oh, wow, we have a domestic player of scale. We don't think that other players will be able to stand up scale uh, equally as fast. And so like they were, you know, a beneficiary of that, but like to make that trade or have, have insight into that to actually get the returns from that, right? You would need to be thinking ahead of that. Like, so you need to, need to understand that company, know who it is. When the IRA passed, you probably got pulled up immediately and saw that return. So that's like a perfect case study for 
like why you need to be ahead of these things because like when as soon as something changes like the the trade's already made right people are already thinking so about we're too these late things. is what you're saying we're too late <laughs> potentially you blew it. There, right there's there still could be there still could be other opportunities <laughs> right but like i think the trade that you're thinking about um you know that was one that was a lot of people were making yeah next time joel next time <laughs> yeah he's saying he's saying basically you're a kook uh, sustainable <laughs> investing. stick well, to my day, day job Shanu, uh, I'm sure very wealthy people pay you a lot of money for this kind of expertise. So as much as Owen and I are enjoying the, the free consulting, I think we'll, we'll let you get back to your day job. But um, you mentioned uh, your entry point into this field where you might have um, read, seen some, you said, apoc apocalyptic information about climate in our future. So we try to avoid that stuff here on the Climate Rebels podcast. We don't want to talk about the doomsdayers and the... Um, pessimistic future that we think the worst impacts of climate might have. And we like to instead focus on optimism and hope. So what gives you hope for the future? This might be cheesy, but I, I, honestly, just like the level of depth of like topics of what we're talking about with climate change now versus three years ago versus five years ago is so much more deep uh, and, and nuanced than, than what it was before, right? The level of talent going into climate is is insane. I mean, like if you look at all the venture capital firms that have sprung up, all the startups that have sprung up, I mean, like this thing has real legs in terms of attracting some of the smartest minds um, that are one, passionate about the issue, which is really important, but two, just like really smart people that are good problem solvers. And so, I mean, I think like even like two years ago, if I told you that, you know, we'd have companies in talking about scope two emissions and their power purchasing plans and, and other buying unbundled wrecks, like two years ago, I think most folks in a C-suite room would be like, what are you talking about? And now it's like, you know, like people are getting named in like a Bloomberg articles or talking specifically about it. You have the person that's literally purchasing those credits or defining that plan for the company on the phone with you. And, and I think so like, that's just like one, you know, anecdote of the broader, level of depth that we're going into these things. And so like, I, I know people always bicker or, or get depressed about like how fast it is relative to some, you know, pathway that was laid out in a theoretical model. But the fact of the matter is all we can measure off is, is, is what's happening and relative to where we've been and we're moving faster than ever. So I always try to focus on that optimistic part. And I, I think when I see all those signals, I get, you know, encouraged. Well, thank you, Shanu. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for joining the Climate Rebels podcast. Um, we've learned a ton. We'll have to have you back in the future. But um before we wrap up, tell the tell our audience how do we find you? We've we've, we've celebrated your amazing uh, Twitter handle today, so we've got to make sure people know where to find it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Hopefully, uh, Joel and Owen didn't oversell it, but uh, yeah, you can find me on <laughs> Sh Shanu Matthew nine three on Twitter or uh, on Threads now, I guess right is the competing platform. But uh, I, I share stuff there. Feel free to connect on LinkedIn or, or email me at my day job. But always just looking to explore these topics in more depth and just get smarter. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, you can find us on most of the social media platforms at Join Raven. So that's Join, and Raven is with a Y, R A Y V E N. You can find this podcast and more great content at joinraven.com. If you like the podcast, please subscribe, like, and share with your friends. And until next time, we encourage you, encourage you to ask yourself what are you doing to fight the climate crisis? Mm -hmm.